Hello and thank you for watching this video. I am Rano Vrovac, the designer of Swords Around the Throne, a historical board game allowing two players to reenact the Napoleonic Wars between 1805 and 1815 on a grand strategic scale. Solo rules will be provided online after the launch of the game. For those of you who do not know me, I have already three published designs under my belt. Age of Napoleon was published by Phalanx Games in 2003 and then republished in 2007. The Price of Freedom, the American Civil War 1861-1865, was one of the very first board games published by Compass Games in 2008. And finally, the Big Push, Trench Warfare on the Western Front in the First World War, was published by Holland Spiel just a few years ago. My first design, Age of Napoleon, received a Charlie Award for Best pre-World War II war game at the 2003 World War Gaming Convention, and both designer Mark Herman and the late Richard Byrd were quite fond of it. Swords Around the Throne covers the same topic as Age of Napoleon, pretty much at the same scale, but it is a radically new and different design. Swords Around the Throne uses a simple point-to-point -point representation of Europe in the Napoleonic time. Let's focus on the card on the map. There are 23 regions distributed among 12 powers. The players represent the leading powers, France or Great Britain. There are four major powers, Austria, Russia, Prussia and Spain. And there are six minor powers, Bavaria, Westphalia, Italy, Naples, Portugal and Sweden. Swords Around the Throne is first and foremost the struggle between France and Great Britain to gain control of mainland Europe through a system of alliances or even, in the case of France in particular, through conquest. France and Great Britain never switch sides, but every other power can be aligned with France, be part of the coalition with Great Britain, or be neutral, depending on how successful the players are in defending or changing their diplomatic status. The diplomatic status of each minor power or major power is tracked on this display at the bottom of the map. What you see here is the situation at the start of 1805. Austria is a locked coalition member, meaning that it is controlled by the coalition and it is immune to French diplomacy for all of 1805. The same is true of Russia. Sweden, on the other hand, is an unlocked coalition member, meaning that France could change its diplomatic status with a successful diplomacy action. Prussia here is a locked neutral power, meaning that neither side controls it, and normally it is immune to either side's diplomacy. However, a special rule for 1805 dictates that it is not immune to coalition diplomacy. Portugal here is an unlocked neutral power. Bavaria and Westphalia are both unlocked French allies. But like for coalition members, French allies can be locked through diplomacy actions and made immune to coalition diplomacy for as much as a full game turn. Italy here is a French dominion. French dominions are, in a sense, permanently locked French allies because they are either integrated into the French Empire or ruled by one of Napoleon's protégés. The trade-off is that a French dominion can be targeted by an insurgency action and become a quagmire. A quagmire is a power that is partially controlled by both sides but favors the coalition and that is particularly difficult for France to regain control of. Of course, think of Spain from 1808 going forward. There are two more types of diplomatic status that are not present in the 1805 setup and they only apply to major powers. French subjugated powers and coalition subjugated, subjugated powers. This diplomatic status reflects military occupation but no change of government and no alignment yet. 
Just like French dominions, however, French subjugated powers can be targeted by insurgency actions. The diplomatic status of each power dictates which side, if any, controls it and to what extent, which in turn dictates what resources in the form of action cards, armies, or leaders can be drawn from that power. Also, the French player wins an early victory if at the end of any game turn all four major powers are French dominions, French allies, or French subjugated powers. The coalition player can win an early victory if they force France to surrender. If neither player wins an early victory, then victory at the end of the last game turn goes to the player who has improved the balance of military power in their favor compared to what it was at the beginning of the game, and that is measured by the difference in the number of armies available to each side based on the powers that they control. So the more powers you control, and the stronger those powers are, the more armies are available to you, and therefore the more likely you are to win the game. Of course, it is not just a matter of the diplomatic situation and the military situation at the end of the game. The more cards, army or leaders are available to you during the game, and the more likely you are to score an early victory or at least score an end of game victory. Therefore, your entire focus is on gaining or retaining control of as many major and minor powers as you can. Of course, Austria and Russia are the biggest prizes but minor powers still count, let alone Prussia and Spain. To this end, you have three types of actions at your disposal, diplomacy actions, insurgency actions, and campaign actions. Diplomacy actions seek to change the diplomatic status of powers in your favor, but not all of them are amenable to your diplomatic overtures, as they could be locked or otherwise. And your opponent, in any case, will likely use their own diplomatic resources to counter you where they need to. Insurgency actions by the coalition player seek to turn the powers that are under French subjugation or dominion against France and cause those powers to become quagmires. Meanwhile, insurgency actions by the French player seek to restore Napoleonic rule or order in quagmires. When diplomacy is ineffective and populations under French rule or boot are docile, Campaign actions allow you to muster armies and attack or defend. As Clausewitz said, war is nothing but a continuation of politics with a mixture of other means. Actions need to be planned ahead and then executed. That is what action cards are for. Each player has access to a set of 27 action cards. Here is the French set with 15 French cards, two Spanish cards, four Russian cards, four Austrian cards, and two Prussian cards. Here is the coalition set. There are 15 British cards where there were 15 French cards in the other set. There are also four Russian cards, four Austrian cards, two Spanish cards, and two Prussian cards. There are four types of action cards. Diplomacy cards. You can see the icon in the bottom left. That's a diplomacy icon. Insurgency cards, a fire icon in the case an insurgency card. Campaign cards, the horseman, bottom left, indicates a campaign action card. And finally, opportunity cards which show all types, all three types of action icons, diplomacy, insurgency, and campaign. Only the French and British have all four types of cards. There are no Austrian, Russian, or Prussian insurgency cards. There are no Prussian or Spanish diplomacy cards, and there are no Austrian, Prussian, or Spanish opportunity cards. The distribution of card types is different between French and British cards. While there are two opportunity cards and two insurgency cards on both sides, France has more and on average stronger campaign cards, while Britain has more and on average stronger British uh, diplomacy cards. 
reflecting the different strength of the two leading powers. Each action card is either a strength one card with only one action icon or a strength two card with two action icons. Of course, strength two cards are more powerful and more valuable than strength one cards. A number of cards in the coalition set display action icons on a yellow background rather than a white background. In almost all cases, it's the second action icon from the left. In one case, both action icons are actually on yellow background. This yellow background is a visual remember that these cards are only strength to cards if certain conditions have been met. For instance, the yellow icon only becomes usable on some of the Austrian or Prussian cards if and once Austria or Prussia, respectively, previously surrendered to France. And the yellow icon on one of the two Russian campaign cards only becomes usable if and once France invaded Russia. So how do you get and how do you use these action cards? There are three phases in each game turn. They are summarized here on the left side of the map. The preparation phase, the action phase, and the winter quarters phase. In the preparation phase, you collect all the cards in your faction set. So here we have the French faction set and then you remove the cards from your set that correspond to powers that you do not control. In 1805 France does not control Russia or Austria or Prussia so the French player would remove all those cards. French player will always control France, of course, and in this case, in 1805, the French player also controls Spain, so those cards stay in the set. Next, based on what powers are controlled, you, con you select between 10 or 15 cards, between 10 and 15 cards for your action deck for uh, the game turn. The first thing you will do is go through the major powers. In this case, it is only Spain. And for every major power, there is half of the cards that you must choose, that you must select, and the other half that is uh, optional. So obviously there are only two Spanish cards here. I must select one and then I can or not select the other one. After selecting cards for the major powers, you select cards for the minor powers. As you probably have noticed, there are no cards that uh, bear the flags of minor powers. In fact, controlling minor powers allow you to select cards from your leading power, France in this case. If we look at the situation in 1805, France controls Bavaria, Italy and Westphalia. Uh, the French player gets to select one French card for every two minor powers. So in this case, three divided by two is one and a half. Round down every two means one card will be selected for the minor powers controlled by France. Finally, you get to select cards for your leading power based on controlling your leading power. That is up to 10 cards. Uh, but that number is also uh, taking into account that you can never have fewer than 10 cards in your hand, but also never more than 15 cards in your hand. In this case, let's assume that both Spanish cards were selected by the French player, and there was also one French card that was selected on the basis of the minor powers controlled by France. That's a total of three cards. So the French player can select 10 additional French cards, since 10 plus 3 is 13, it's between 10 and 15, the minimum and maximum that are allowed. Next, once you've selected all of your cards for your deck, you shuffle it and then you draw half of your deck into your starting hand. So depending on how many cards are in your deck, 
you will draw between five and eight cards. The other cards left in your deck, it is important to understand, you will be able to draw first at the rate of one card per action round, and then all remaining cards after the third action round. So at one point in time, which is midpoint through the action phase, all the cards that you selected in the preparation phase will have made it to your hand. So there is no uncertainty from that standpoint. The only uncertainty is when those cards will show up in your hand. And in fact, for those players who are averse to any randomness, there is an optional rule referred to as the Eurogamer rule, which allows to replace all drawing with selecting cards. Although that optional rule is not recommended for very short games of a duration of three or fewer game turns. Finally, you must plan a number of actions. That's the end step of the preparation phase. You do so by placing action card phase down in your so-called planned action row. On each side of the game board, you can see a graphic guide for the six slots in your planned actions row that correspond from left to right to the six rounds in the action phase. One, two, three, four, five, six. The guide is on every side of the board, even though there are only two players at most, so that the board can be oriented in the direction that both players find the most convenient. If you are the French player, you must initially plan action for the first two rounds of the action phase. The same is true if you are the coalition player and at the start of the game turn, Britain stands alone, which means that there are no major powers that are coalition members. Other diplomatic status for major powers or the diplomatic status of minor powers is irrelevant in this case. However, if the coalition includes at least one major coalition member next to Great Britain, then as the coalition player, you must initially plan action for the first three rounds, representing the greater difficulty of coordinating uh, major powers alongside with Britain. So let's, uh, as an example, put the two cards that the French player must plan. Now we can move to the action phase. As mentioned previously, the action phase is divided into six rounds, and each round is divided into two player turns. In one player turn, one player is the active player and the other player is the reactive player, and then the roles are reversed in the second player turn of the round. Who is what and when depend on what action cards were planned for the present action round. So here, let's reveal the French card I placed earlier. The French player planned an opportunity card. Let's bring up a card which we will assume was the card planned for the first action round by the coalition player. It is an insurgency card. Each action card has a priority rating ranging from one to four. All opportunity cards have a rating of one. All diplomacy cards have a prior rating of two. All insurgency cards have a prior rating of three. And all campaign cards have a priority rating of four. So in our example here, the French player played an opportunity card with a rating of one. The coalition player played an insurgency card with a rating of three. Priority would therefore go to the French player, the lower rating. And the French player would be the active player in the first player turn of the round. And then uh, the roles would be reversed and the coalition player would be the active player in the second player turn of the round. What if, however, the coalition player had also planned an opportunity card? In this case, the priority ratings would be tied. However, each priority rating is in a circle that is either blue or red. If there is a tie in priority rating and the circle is blue, then priority goes to the French. 
that is true for opportunity cards and campaign cards. If on the other hand, the priority ratings are tied, but are in a red circle, just as the case is for diplomacy cards and insurgency cards, then the priority goes to the coalition player. So the color is the tiebreaker. So in the case that we, or the example that we are following, sorry, the coalition player had played an insurgency card, the French player had planned an opportunity card, so the French player goes first. Because it is an opportunity card, it is time to decide whether that card will be used as a diplomacy card, as an insurgency card, or as a campaign card. Remember that actions are planned ahead either two or three rounds ahead. You do not know what your opponent is planning and you do not know what the situation will be by the time you get to execute the card. So planning an opportunity card allows you to delay the decision of what action you will take until you've seen what card was planned by your opponent for the same round and until you can see how the game situation has evolved. This, of course, makes opportunity cards extremely valuable, which is why they are scarce and why they should always be the first cards you select for your deck. So three types of uh, actions and the resolution of each type of action is similar. In particular, the resolution of diplomacy actions or insurgency actions really follow the same pattern. First, as the active player playing such a card, you must select a valid target, i.e. a power that can be affected by the card you played. That also indicates what final score you will need for your action to be successful, depending on the situation. It may be at least one or at least two. The strength of your card indicates your initial score, either one or two. Then a few situational factors, such as the presence of armies, either friendly or enemy, uh, may increase or decrease your score. Finally, your opponent may play one card from their hand in reaction to your action to decrease your score by the card's strength. Let's assume here that this opportunity card was used as an insurgency action the initial score for the insurgency would be one. There's only one insurgency icon. And then let's assume that there are no other situational factors that apply, and it is now time for the coalition player to play a card in a reaction. Maybe the coalition player has this card in their hand, and they are able to play it in reaction. And let's assume that the condition required for the second icon is not yet in place. Then this would be a strength one insurgency card played in reaction against the French insurgency action. And that would reduce the French score by one. As the last step of the resolution process, the active player, in this example, the French player, could play a card from their hand as well in support of their own action. And here, the strength of the card will be added to the uh, current score. So uh, that's not an obligation. But let's assume that the French player also had an insurgency action card in hand with a strength of one. The French player could play this card in support of their insurgency action. It would add one back to the score. So if we follow what happened so far, initial score of one, minus one for this card played in reaction by the coalition player, that's zero, plus one for this card played by the French player in support of their own action. That gives us a final score of plus one and the French insurgency action might be successful if that is the minimum score required. Except for the fact that, of course, the cards in your hand might be drawn randomly, there is no random element 
to the action resolution process. For this reason, I also offer or propose an optional rule that I refer to as the Wargamer rule for those players who prefer to have a little more fog of war and want the opportunity to pull upsets. So that optional Wargamer rule allows the active player to roll a die, which you will have to provide as the last step of the resolution process. And a result of one decreases the score by one, while a result of six increases it by one. It's absolutely possible to use this optional Wargamer role alongside with the optional Eurogamer role. So there's a lot of different ways to play the game. It's worth mentioning now that the French player can take a special diplomacy action that is actually automatically successful. No resolution process is needed. And that special diplomacy action can turn a French subjugated major power into a French dominion. Or he can also turn a limited number of minor French allies into French dominions. Think of Joseph on the throne of Spain or Murat on the throne of Naples. Similarly, the coalition player can take a special insurgency action that, if successful, in this case it is not automatic, forces Napoleon to immediately return to Paris and the French player to lose one random card from their hand. Generally speaking, a successful diplomacy action causes the diplomatic status of a targeted power to change in favor of the active player, as prescribed by the rules, and, depending on the situation, it may result in an army being immediately mustered and cards being added to the active player's deck. A successful insurgency action by the coalition causes the targeted power to become a quagmire, if it was not already won, and results in the placement of one insurgency marker in one of the regions of the targeted power. The presence of insurgency markers makes it more difficult for the French to win combat. And there is, if there is an insurgency marker in every region of a quagmire and no French army, then the quagmire becomes a coalition member that remains locked until the end of the game. On the other hand, a successful insurgency action by France causes the removal of one insurgency marker from one of the targeted powers regions. Campaign cards are played as planned actions to allow the players to muster new armies and move forces of one to three armies at the rate of one new army or one force move per campaign icon. So if this card were played as a campaign, uh, a planned campaign action, uh, the player of that card would be allowed to either muster one army or move one force. If this card was played, it's a strength two campaign card, then the player of that card could muster two armies could muster one army and move one force, possibly including the army that was just mustered, could move two separate forces, or could move the same force twice. So a lot of flexibility, obviously, when you have a strength to campaign card as your planned action. While campaign cards from leading powers can be used to muster or move forces of any nationality, the campaign cards from major powers can only be used to muster armies or move forces with at least one army that is the same nationality as the card being played. So when you muster, you take an available friendly army from off map and you place it on the map in a home region. Here I mustered the Bavarian army, placed it in Bavaria. 
you may be able to deploy a leader at the same time. Uh, generally speaking, leaders are required to move forces of three armies, not to move forces of one or two armies. And some leaders can help in combat based on their abilities. Napoleon, in this case, can help both in attack and in defense. Charles cannot do either. Kutuzov here can help in defense. And Blucher can help in attack. There are two forms of movement by land or by sea. Only the coalition can move one army, which must be British, Swedish, or Russian, and obviously a friendly army by sea. And only one campaign card per game turn can be played to that effect. Sea movement takes place between two coastal regions, for instance, Italy and Naples, or Italy to Andalusia, which are marked with anchor icons of different colors, white, light blue, or dark blue, uh, which indicates what sea zones those coastal regions belong to. And uh, one campaign icon can be moved to, uh, can be used to move an army by sea between coastal regions in the same season or in adjacent season, sea zones. Land movement takes place along a route between adjacent regions. If we Zoom here, you can see that there is a network of routes that connect the various regions. Those routes are either green or red. Red indicates difficult land routes which affect movement and uh, combat as well. Moving a force into an enemy-held region results in combat unless the enemy force can and decides to evade combat, which cannot be prevented. So let's assume that it's the coalition player's turn and the coalition player decides to move Charles and Hiller and Bellegarde from Vienna to Bavaria. Bavaria is held by the Bavarian army. If the Bavarian army cannot or choose not to evade, then there is combat. Combat is resolved similarly to diplomacy and insurgency actions, although in this case, the initial score is not the strength of the campaign card played, but it is equal to the number of armies that attacked. In this case, we're talking about two armies, so the initial combat score would be two for the coalition player. Then, a number of situational factors modify the combat score, such as the number of defending armies, one in this case, or, uh, depending on certain conditions, the number of adjacent friendly or enemy armies. As mentioned already, the offensive or defensive benefit of the leaders involved in the combat may also modify the combat score. Finally, just like for diplomacy or insurgency action resolution, the reactive player can play a card from their hand to decrease the active player's combat score, while the active player can play a card from their hand to increase their own combat score. Normally, as the active player, you need either a score of one or higher uh, to win combat, although a score of zero would suffice if you only attacked an isolated garrison. Uh, garrisons are assumed to be in every region, even if there is not an enemy army, as long as that region is enemy controlled. If you don't score the required score, you lose combat. Army losses are determined. They are uh, proportional to the absolute value of the combat score. So the higher the combat score, the higher the number of losses, and then the defeated force must retreat if it can. Campaigns may lead to a variety of diplomatic outcomes, such as neutrality, violation, liberation, successful or failed insurgency. But the most critical outcome is to force the surrender of an enemy power by holding its capital region. 
and having more armies in the power than your opponent. This will cause the surrendering power to join your side if it is a minor power or to become neutral or subjugated at your option if it is a major power. If France surrenders, the coalition wins the game. All right, let's go back to the sequence of a player turn. Before you implement the action you have planned for the present round, if it is early enough in the action phase, you will be able to change actions that you had planned farther ahead, but this will be at the cost of discarding the action cards that you had used uh, to plan without being able to actually use those cards. So there is a cost. After you implement the action that you have planned for the present round, you draw one card, as long as your deck still has cards, and then you must plan another action as long as there is an empty slot left in your planned action row. Of course, you never plan an action for the following game turn, only as far as the sixth round of the current game turn. You should also know that on occasion you will be forced to pass or may choose to pass during your player turn, meaning that you won't execute any action, but you'll still be able to change plans, draw a card and or plan a new action. Once all six rounds of the action phase are completed, the winter quarters phase begins. First, victory conditions are checked. And if one player has won, the game is of course over. If not, armies that are out of supply are removed as losses. This only happens if, it, if, if these armies end the turn in an enemy control region and cannot trace a line of supply back to a friendly controlled capital region so keep your lines of supply in mind. Then lock diplomatic status markers are flipped to their unlock side, making it possible in the following game turn to target certain powers with diplomatic actions. And finally, that new game turn begins. All right, hopefully this gives you a decent idea of gameplay. Obviously a number of details have been glossed over, but not too many. The game is all about planning a limited number of actions, six per game turn, and executing them, finding the right mix of diplomacy, insurgency, or campaign actions to defend and expand your control of the European mainland. Swords Around the Throne should launch on January 5th, 2022, in about one month. I will use the GameCrafter.com crowd sales platform and their production capabilities. The starting price will be a retail price of $56 plus taxes and shipping, but every 10 orders will contribute to reduce the price during the crowd sale only. For instance, 100 orders will take the price down to $40 plus taxes and shipping, so a discount of 20, sorry, of $16. Unlike a traditional P500 program, the game will be printed even if there is only one order. But let's try to do a little better than that, okay? Also, because the game is printed in the USA on demand and shipped individually by thegamecrafter.com, the wait for your game once the crowd sale is over on January 31st should only be a couple of months not a year or two, as is often the case for P500 programs or Kickstarter offerings. After the crowd sale, the game will only be available at the retail price of $56 plus taxes and shipping charges from the GameCrafters.com web store or directly from me. So don't miss the crowd sale and spread the word. Thank you 